Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode eight. This is a special episode. First time having this guest, and he is a really cool guy. You may know him online as Outlaw for. Oh, I almost used your old name, <laughs> Outlaw for RC, but you are Outlaw Quadrant. <laughs> yeah, that was, long, that was a long time ago. Ooh, yeah. we can get into that. But yes, welcome to the stream. I am Mordez, and let me allow myself to introduce the awesome Rich Castro, also known as Outlaw Quadrant. Hi, how you doing today? Oh, I am doing well, and you? Oh, pretty awesome. Uh, just did some practice earlier for these new manufacturer races, the schedule that we have going. And yeah, man, the, some things changed as far as the uh, the way that the points are given out goes. And it's pretty uh, interesting. It's kind of controversial, I guess. But what do you think? How do you feel about the changes yourself? Uh, I took a look over it this morning and to some extent it does remind me a little bit about the nations format where it only counts a certain amount of the scores but it's a little bit different because with nations you're just racing um, for yourself whereas in manu it looks like they are counting 5 out of 20 but it that's only regarding picking the manufacturer and so in some regards I feel like this is good if you don't have the time to race, um, don't have the time to practice, don't have the time to race every single event. On the flip side, you know, if you have someone in your region also competing for that same menu, then you're still going to need to beat that guy first and then also worry about the menu poison. So there's a, there's a give and take. I do feel like 5 out of 20 is too little, too little for it to yeah. count just because... You know, I think uh, someone else put out a spreadsheet and, you know, trying to see what would have happened if they applied something like that for the preseason and the points are a lot closer. And, of course, that's what people, you know, playing under the old rules. And so with the new one, it is quite possible we're going to get highs and whatnot. So it could be to where it's 5 out of 20, but realistically, you you might need to, at the very least, race all the events in which your menu is going to be good at, but... On the flip side, like I said, you you can skip races, and so you have a like a strong group four car, but your group three car is not very good. Then you can focus on group four, and not worry about group three. So, like I said, there's some pluses and minuses. It just depends on um, your situation. Yeah, it's definitely true. If you're, uh, you know, there are some manufacturers that are lucky and that they in that they have both a strong three and group four car, and so I think it, every ma manufacturer. Uh, even the ones like that, they may have a really terrible, except for like Ferrari. I mean, there's some that have, what I'm just trying to say is like, you're right. Yes. Some, if you focus just on group four, you can get by better than preseason where it was just kind of half and half. But that's good. I mean, in some ways, some people are going to start to shine because there have been physics changes and everything too that and we've been seeing the results of that but the races are shorter and we'll get back to that coverage on the Gran Turismo Sport kind of thing uh, we, but what I wanted to do first was talk a little bit about your history how long you've been doing Gran Turismo and just allowing everyone to get to know you a little bit better ah yes um, <laughs> how far back should I go um, let's go back to uh, I'm gonna go really far back, like, and yeah. I mean really far back. We're talking about 1980 something, and okay. it's kind of weird to start right there. But um, I still re like one of my earliest memories is being in a cabin, and I think it was in Las Vegas, if I remember correctly, at uh, up in the mountains, and they had this um, arcade game in the cabin, and it had. A racing game of some sort and I can't remember which one it was it could have been something involving trucks but I I can't quite remember what game it was but I think that was my first real interaction with racing games in general and I think from that moment on there was just something about me and racing games that clicked and so when I first when I bought my first uh, console like again this is really long time ago so we're talking about nintendo Entertain entertainment system or the nes it's way before uh, way before fortnite yeah but um i bought uh excite bike i bought there's like another racing game i can't remember and so that was kind of 
how it started with racing games in general. Then I jumped over to Genesis. I had Super Monaco GP. I had... There were a few others in that console as well. And then when I got to the PlayStation, I... Obviously, I didn't really know what Gran Turismo was. No one knew at the time, unless you were reading magazines, like, hey, this new yeah. game is coming out. And to this day, I remember I was at a Walmart looking for a new game because I had some money. And to on one side, you had Metal Gear Solid, which, if I recall correctly, has a very very strange cover. Like, it's not really much of a cover, so I didn't even know what that game was. And then yeah. next to it was Gran Turismo. And seeing that silhouette of a car made me want to buy Gran Turismo over Metal Gear Solid. And so you could kind of say, like, if Metal Gear Solid had a better cover, then maybe I never would have gone into Gran Turismo. But I'm glad I got into Gran Turismo <laughs> because I played that game. And I remember watching the intro to Gran Turismo. And just, of course, we're talking about 1990s. And so if you look at the intro today, it's like, wow, this looks kind of old. But <laughs> back then, it was just a mind blowing oh, piece to yeah, see man. this whole presentation. Like, hey, you got the music playing, you got the, you know, the, the trailer opening, you see the car coming out. And I got hooked. I think like the scene that got me like, I'm totally in is when you have the blur effect. And then the Castro Supra comes into focus coming right at you. It's like, damn, I love this game already. <laughs> and so yes. ever since then, I've been, uh, like I said, I've bought pretty much every Gran Turismo except for yeah. Tourist Trophy and like maybe like some of the oddballs here and there, like the prologues. Like I don't have one of the prologues, but otherwise I have awesome. all of them. And in fact, I even got uh, Kazunori to sign. Uh, he, I got him to sign one through four and my PS2 console. So And I still have that. I have it actually. I have it right next to me right now. Like I have it right below me because oh, I'm nice. playing that. Yeah, you bring them over to the events and stuff too, which I think is awesome. I tried to. I've tried to. I I did it for Vegas, but we, <laughs> it didn't. It, there was no connection to. They didn't have a. Uh, they had AV inputs, but it didn't work. And then I realized, oh, I need to get HDMI to make it work. And I got it to work yeah. in Paris, and I got. Um, I got like some of the top guys in my room late at night playing Gran Turismo. Like we were doing license yeah. tests, we were doing uh, a couple of races. It was a bunch. It was a lot That's of awesome. fun. It's, it's. I mean, it's this different. The de feeling must have been different compared to regionals where it felt like no one had time for that because everything's so serious. But going to World Tours, that's what's so fun about them. It's a lot more laid back. Oh, I think we still would have had time to play. Like I, we had, I had guys in my room wanting to play the game. Like we were ready to go, and oh, just, yeah. the, the thing just didn't. It didn't work, and so that was a little bit disappointing. But you know, it's kind of one of those things. Like you know, we're out, we're all together for a something that most of us enjoyed. I mean, I know like we're gonna be probably gonna be griping about a lot of things, but you know, <laughs> if we didn't if we didn't care about the game, you know, we we could you exactly. know we could just get up and leave and just play Forza or play something else. Yeah. But you know, we're still playing the game, for so sure. there's still the passion is still there. It's just That's awesome. Yeah, I would say you were one of the more loyal players of the franchise, and um, you obviously collect them and stuff. So you're a great ambassador for the game, and that's awesome. I mean, what, 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 when you were talking about the early, your early kind of experience with the franchise, I th just made me think about how cool, um, how mystical and kind of larger than life uh, PD was able to kind of paint the this you know motorsports as being this cool. Uh, thing that i don't know to me it always they made it seem almost as fantastical as like dragons the way that they portrayed it you know they oh no it. i mean I, absolutely i mean just the presentation of everything from the start i mean there's one thing you have to admire the series for is just they do care a lot about how the game looks and just how it's just it's supposed to grab you in and never let you go just to give you this wow factor like i said for a lot of us that was our introduction to um, a lot of the, you know, obviously the first few games were more focused on Japanese cars, but for a lot of us, that was like our first introduction to like the, to the Supra and the Nissan GTR and the, uh, RX-7, uh, WRX, it's just all these cars that, you know, we didn't even know that they were, some of us didn't even know that they existed, but, uh, PD had introduced it to us, and like I said, it, you know, it was just the timing of it too, it's like, you know, you had that game, you had, 
uh, I think Fast and the Furious came out shortly oh, afterwards. Yeah. It's just you know just it's just perfect combinations like you know here's something new, here's something exciting from um, that you haven't seen before, and it is like wow, this is this is you know when I was like 14 at the time, so I was like wow, this is so exciting, this is something new, it's like it's just, it's just the wow factor, and even today, like you know I. Honestly, I, I still haven't looked at all the special, you know, you know, they have a lot of great stuff in GT Sport that they want to present to you about the cars in general. I haven't even had a chance to look at them all, but I hope to get around to it one day because I honestly, I bought the game. I just started playing right away. I didn't even look yeah. at that stuff, but I want to look at it later at some point. Yeah, that's one of those games you just wanted to dive into immediately. Uh, I mean, that's just whenever a game did come out, uh, I would, the first thing I would do is the license test and just get lost into that and then obviously once gt5 came out it was all about online and yeah then things really changed and community started growing up and uh gt planet was a big uh part of our of both of our gran turismo kind of lives so yeah i think i think that's how we first uh that's kind of the way we first met just because they had a I think it was like I forget what league it was. I think it was the I want to say it was the Mazda Roadsters. Yeah. I want to say that was they had a, there was a post out there on GT Planet about Mazda Roadsters, and I wanted to get into it because uh, when GT Five came out, that's when I I had been a pad player up until uh, I think Prologue, and that's when I had I think I already had the wheel, but that's when I decided I needed to switch to a wheel, and GT Five you know GT Five came out, and I was hundred like day one was like. You ditch the pad, go to the wheel, and I, I obviously going to need practice racing against other people because it's obviously it's a there's a different uh, it's a different animal between driving by yourself with the wheel and having to go side by side with other people. And I think I found a thread about Mazda Miatas or something, and that's how I met. I think I met you there, and then a number of people. Uh, Jason uh, Miller. Yeah. R sixteen hundred turbo is still around, poking around there now. Oh yeah, I. I yeah, I, I kind of see. I, it's kind of nice to see some old names come back. That's, it's kind of refreshing. Like I, I think I saw Kuda Man show up. Yeah. Like once or Kuda twice. Man, the first GT Academy champ. Yeah. Yeah, GT Planet is awesome. It's great uh, collection of people. One day we're gonna do a GT Planet only episode. Try to bring some of the uh, the heavyweights from that forum. Uh, it's so dependable and consistent and well maintained it's it's just a really cool achievement of a website it's been going for you know well over 10 years super i mean it could be going on 20 years yeah once we're in the 2020s it's gonna it's the 20th anniversary is not gonna be too far away so <laughs> i just amazed you to think that it's been that long already it's <laughs> kind of uh it's kind of funny to think i think i it didn't even dawn on me that grant Turismo has been out for more than 20 years and it's like oh man now i feel like a really old <laughs> guy out there it's like like all of these it, it's been so long that they, now you got all these up and coming players that are 15 years younger than me and just <laughs> i can't lie like i can't i don't have much for them but i you know it's not like i'm not going to keep trying yeah exactly you can hang in there and and 16 slots is is a lot even though you know, when you're considering the top you know uh, players, you can always squeeze in, and that's what, well, that's what I love about it. Even though the squeeze com- seems well, it's twenty in uh, FIA, but you can always compete uh, around there, around the top. And if something goes wrong for the top guys, you know you can always sneak through, which is awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it's all about trying to get better, even in, uh, and adapting uh, these days to stuff. It's just some people are a little quicker for whatever reason. But yeah, you and I are thirty. Well, I'm thirty-two. You're. I'm going to be 35. Yours. It's yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be 35 soon. Yeah. So, and we grew up in the same place, which is it was really striking to me when I it was over at your parents' place, and it was like in the same neighborhood almost as uh, where I grew up, and we just didn't never really bumped into each other because we were kind of you know you would you would be in junior high while I was in elementary and and so on. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's kind of the kind of those one of those weird things like oh we're you know we're close to each other like uh, me and. Uh, someone else, you know, he's up in 
uh, Tacoma, so in the, which isn't too far from where I live, and so it's kind of like, oh, look at that! It's like, I can't, <laughs> and he, and of course he's faster than me, and so it's like I can't even be the fastest guy in the <laughs> state. It's like, come on, I can't get a break. <laughs> well, hey, you're the fastest in your county, I think. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I got that <laughs> going for me. <laughs> that is funny when they allowed the, you to see the rankings of your county. Suddenly you're like, oh, I'm so I'm so glad I'm ahead of this dude. Or oh no, he's beating me. He leaves right next to me. It's it's tough to be in California though. Oh my gosh, there's so much competition there. Oh yeah, it, that makes me think of the. Um, I think it was my what what was the GT Academy year where um, if you were on the East Coast, you're pretty much done. Like you, there was it was just you had no chance because it was broken up in like five oh, six I, regions remember. i can't i can't remember that one yeah yeah I can't, yeah that was a long time ago but anyway yeah i think yeah it goes to show if you can be the king of your state in a big state well it's a lot but i'm in nevada not much competition here to be honest well i was like i was competition then i then i moved and so oh well, yeah you're... just a second yeah yeah for sure uh, no that was man we had some great races and I remember the uh, RM models from GT5, the the cars that had racing oh, yeah. or whatever. I forgot what it stood for. Like race modified, maybe? Yeah, something like that, yeah. They had the S14. You had a, pretty much, you know, any of the super popular cars uh, had racing versions. And the Miata had its own, too, which we built a league around, flying Miata Super Cup. Oh, uh, yeah, those were, man, you know. I keep saying like I want that car back just uh, so that I could, you know. But maybe maybe like that was like the one car I felt like really good at. How ridiculous is reason. that? Like take a Miata, and make it even lighter. Yes. <laughs> Put roll case, st- add stiffness. All of that equals insane fun. Uh, there was just a story I actually posted on my Twitter. Go to twitter.com. Nah, don't go to the URL. <laughs> just go to at Suarez Racing, uh, and you'll find the story I. Uh, retweeted from i forget his name but anyway the uh his last name is rollinson and Mm -hmm. he it was an f1 driver in the 60s and the 70s and he uh had terminal cancer and when he was on his last kind of uh, week or two he decided to take a miata to silverstone and just thrash it around for one last time that's that's a nice way to go to do (laughs) you know it's kind of good that you could you know tell the ability to do that you know (laughs) Hopefully we all can do something like that before we go. It's like, okay, go out there and go on the racetrack and just go crazy. Yeah, why not? I, I would be in, I would be supportive of that big time. I would donate and retweet all all over again. But um, yeah, Miatas. So have you always liked Miatas? Has that always been a particular make? I, I don't. Model? I can't explain it. It's just it's just it's just something with the car that. I was able to drive really fast. I, yeah, I, it's one. It's just it's a very strange um, thing. Like I, I, I even like one time. Like I think I beat um, one of the U, one of the really fast UK guys in the Miata. Like okay, it was just a practice race, but I was able to keep up with them oh, the man. whole time. And I <laughs> just like I beat I beat him to the line like point oh oh something seconds. Like yes, at least, <laughs> I, at least I was able to do that. But you know, then again, I remember like in that game, it was like the I will admit like the slipstream helped because it was kind of like. Weak oh yeah, slipstream. Yeah, like how weak is now? Uh, yeah, like GTS. how weak is now? Yeah, that used to be what we had to deal with every single race. So Daniel Dajlam, if you're listening, uh, don't go back in time and play that game. You won't like it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. Like I remember, there was yeah some tracks. It was just like pass fest. Oh yeah, that's Mom. why we liked our city circuits and. Um, like Laguna Seca's you know, tight circuits were were good because then it, that kind of it kind of eliminated that insane toe a bit. Yeah, like at Monza, I beat uh, one of my best victories ever was um, beating a. Uh, I know his name was Tony something, but I don't oh, think Tony, he races yeah, anymore. Tony yeah, thirteen eleven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it was something at Monza. In was it uh, Super GT? I can't remember what car it was, but I still I think I still have the. The, the race clip of that, like the oh, nice. finish of that, but it was like 45 minute race and the slipstream was as such and so like Kiki was like a second faster than just about everyone else per lap, but I was, I managed to stay in the slipstream for 45 minutes and I just like, I was right behind him, like at 45 minutes of racing and I think this was even a pit stop and I was still with him on the, on the slipstream and 
coming out of uh, Parabolica, uh, this was like the old Monza, and so I think that's the name. That's Parabolica. It's grass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, there there was still grass. If you go too wide, you don't have the asphalt, and so he mm-hmm. went just a tiny bit wide because it's like he felt. I think he felt the pressure. Like he, I was there. I was like ran in his bumper. He sensed the pressure. He just pushed it just a wee bit too much. He clipped the grass, and I passed on the wind. That was nice. like I said. That, that, that's like one of my highlights of <laughs> my my Gran Turismo career. Like just yeah, just being able him. to do that. Like even yeah. like I know I know Grant you like Slipstream made it possible, but you know well, you held on, man. That's, that's yeah, an achievement. Yeah. Yeah, I held on for forty five minutes, which is like, oh. how did I do that? <laughs> and I can't awesome. even. And of course, the funny thing is, like in GT Sport, I can't even do that. I can't even like unlap one. One of the bad things about myself is that you'll notice, like, if you watch any of my racing clips, like the first lap, whoever's ahead of me is always going to get away, but like by just over a second, just because for some reason I struggle. I just struggle with the slipstream a lot more in GT Sport than the other in, games. In terms I don't of know dirty why. Air? I think it's partly the dirty air and partly because I, I still think that I know I know this for certain that the tires are colder at yeah, the start. I felt you can't bad. really see it, but they are colder and my driving style tends to be a little bit soft and I think it just doesn't warm up like my tires stay colder longer and so I just don't have the grip that first lap and I just struggle and the, but then once I get go like by lap two it's like okay, I'm fine now, but then of course I'm I get pressure from behind, but that's that's beside the point. Like, cause like, for some reason, slipstream just kind of bothers me in GT Sport. I have no idea why. Uh, things change, man, and you never know uh, what stuff's going to throw you off. So I can definitely feel for you there. Uh, I mean, that can bring us right into these new physics changes, which uh, have kind of divided people, I would say. It's not as nearly uh, universally hated as... Uh, some people thought it maybe some people kind of more indifferent toward it than I, I think than overall uh, compared to any other feeling I guess how was your what was your take on it well the first thing that I noticed was that the of course I'm going to generalize a little bit because I haven't driven all the cars like I, I haven't even touched like the road cars or group one so this is mostly group four and group three I did notice that the entry seems to be more oversteery like it's more eager to turn in but then on the flip side the exits are just a boatload of understeer and like even the cars that generally have understeer like never understeer like the audi r8 because i've heard like even the audi r8 is understeering which is just mind-blowing because that thing has just been like i can't drive the r8 at all and I, even i can i was able to feel that was understeering really bad on exit and so it's kind of a matter of do you, if you like. I guess a lot of it just depends on your driving style. Like for me, I think it wasn't as bad because my driving style tends to be uh, the slow in, fast out, like a traditional slow in, fast out method. And so mm-hmm. for me, having that better turn in, and then the understeer, like I, I can, my driving style tends to compensate for that already. And so understeer, like I line it up so I don't have to worry too much about understeer and exit. Like I already factor that in. And so for me, I think it's I'm probably a little better off with it, but I can certainly understand if you just don't like that understeer and exit. Like I don't personally, I don't really like. I kind of like what they did the entry side of it, but in the exit, I just I'm not a big fan of it, especially because some of the cars um, people are saying that some of the cars on exit are just utterly um, on rails. Like the BMW, I've heard it's, it used to be a a sketchy car on exit and now you can just f- literally floor that car <laughs> and you're just you're just gonna go off you can't spin the car you have to literally work hard on it to spin the car and so like, all you're really worried about is undisturbing off the corner which like i said it just depends if you're more concerned about lap times rather than general feel because um, some you know some people use a, uh, a controller and so you're probably not going to feel that. But you're, if you're on a wheel, you're definitely going to sense a difference of how everything feels. And depending on whether you like that understeer or exit, just mashing the throttle, you might like it, you might hate it. Uh, it's and Again, I think it really does come down to what style do you have and whether this new physics fit that style. 
And for me, it it fits the style, but I can understand why people are not going to like it because I like to think like understeer is not a lot. Oversteer is, you know, it's always an issue, but it's, it's in a way it's kind of fun. It's a nice challenge to have because you can you can counter that with you know okay correct the wheel or correct the throttle. With understeer is like it just starts pushing and pushing and there's no you can lift off the throttle and it's still understeer. So it's like it's kind of like once you get it, it's like how do you get out of it? You know you don't really have that many options and so like I said I can understand the frustration out there for some people. Yeah, I'm partial. I mean, I I don't really mind it too much, but I do understand it can make certain cars and certain uh, relationships people have with their cars uh, upset. But I think that's what it boils down to is certain people have uh, an idea in their head of how they want these cars to respond to their driving, and, and now that's kind of been uh, jolted. So, yeah, I think people will eventually kind of grow around it and realize it's whatever um uh, when you were talking about it earlier just uh, it made me think of the idea that uh, these cars with the, the update that just happened does it to you would you say that it almost feels like now we have uh the cars feeling like they have um a harder a harder compound in the front versus the rear kind um, of like pre update i i mean i guess you could say that but then it, it wouldn't quite explain the entry of it, the entry side of it, because I, of course, now with more time behind the wheel, I'm starting to forget how the old physics felt like, but it did. Or the reverse, then maybe it's uh, softer tires in the front, harder in the rear. I, it's almost like I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's really that because otherwise it would just be understeering more in general. But then uh, you oh, got... it's not not yeah, not saying that they did that, but um, it's it feels as if. You had the, it, it, you know, like you were to, because some people in the last seat in the preseason actually did that to have a competitive, you know, for strategy, and it didn't feel that different. But I don't know, just a little silly idea. Yeah, I guess I guess it, it is to some extent. It does feel like that. I mean, and of course, it doesn't help that uh, with the changes in the format. Like uh, one thing that I noticed right away with that is that they. Don't, they stop using softs completely, and so you don't have that direct comparison. But I did, do, I did do, I did do tests with the softs, with comp, uh, with the c- combos that uh, we had done uh, right before the change. Like it was, I think it was like the Monza Nations, and I forget the other one. It might have been. Oh, I think it was Autopolis. So I kind of had those two. To compare, because I just done those combos and then they changed everything. And I, like I said, the first thing that I noticed was that entry felt different, like looser. But then the exit was just boatloads of understeer, and uh, with, and of course the tire wear was also changed. So that was another thing. And how I, I used the Mustang for nations, which by the way was a mistake. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I noticed that oh, I had the brake balance all the way to the rear just so that I have even tire wear. But now I, was like, I have it that way. It's like, nope, you're going to burn up the rear if you do that. So you got to dial it back. But like, like I said, oh, the Mustang feels even better on exit now than it did before. So I don't need that brake balance anymore. So like I said, it's, again, it's, it's down to how you want the car to feel. But like my two, my two cents always be like, understeer is no fun. And I don't want more of it. And so why you give me more, give me more of it? No, I want... Yeah, I want my cars to break loose on exit, but then that that because some of the arguments people are making is that it kind of reduces the challenge of the game overall to where the, oh now you can just mash the mash the throttle on exit. There's, there's no there's no need for finesse. It's just oh everyone can do it, and so you can't really gain an advantage or you know it's less about driver skill than just oh just do this and then everyone can run the same lap times, and so that's. I can understand that side of it too. Yeah, because you still get caught out if you don't have a proper entry. Uh, yeah, it's like a little bit easier to get on the throttle, but you, if you're going too fast when you hit the throttle, I mean, a perfect um, counterpoint there is the first race we did with the new physics, which was uh, round ten of, or the final rounds. Was it what was it, in nations? It was round what? Oh, that, I. 
I don't know. Some shit. Something. I don't know. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't touch it, so I, I don't remember. Well, the, only, the one I'm, I'm referencing is uh, the only one I've done, which was round 10 of the preseason for Manufacturer Series. Oh, Maggiore. At Maggiore. And uh, the counterpoint there is turn three. Or wait, wait. One, two, three, four. The right-hander. That's kind of like a little bull. Talking about the uphill right-hander? Yes. I hate that corner. Yeah. <laughs> it already it already was understeer there. So it already <laughs> for me that's like that's like the F corner for me cuz like even before the physics update like that was just understeer city for me I could no, never it was get the line right. Yeah. And now and it's like even worse like no, why? It's worse in some sense but it, it felt it felt nice um because if you did get your entry right and your mid corner speed right and you got on the power it felt like you could get on it a little bit sooner, and yeah, it understeered if you got it wrong, but that would be your fault because you're too comfortable with a nice turn in. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you're going in too fast, then it compromises your exit. So it's uh, showing the guys that had bad habits uh, where those habits uh, need correcting, you know? But I, I had a fun time uh, with that one. But what I won't have a fun time with is if the Bia Peach update. That may or may not happen tomorrow or today, because <laughs> we we are talking on June fourth, and there's maintenance tonight, right? Oh yes, yeah, so it's um, it's like oh, just all of a sudden, just oh, there's maintenance coming up, and of course, you know, it may be like the physics where we don't really get a warning about what's going to happen, and then boom, it's like we fix this and this and this, and then line like the fourth item, is, it's oh we oh by the way, we changed the physics. <laughs> yeah. So it could be no. It could just be. Could we're just speculating here? It could just be a. Well, let's get everything ready for the regular season. But of course, I think everyone wants bop changes. Yeah, it's either going to be housekeeping or home wrecking. You know, that's kind of that's kind of tension. That <laughs> I love the way you put that. That's great. <laughs> so we don't know. But uh, going back, so for future, you know, for future listeners, uh, so you know which update in particular we're talking about, it's uh, 1.39. And it released on May 30th. And one of the other features, I haven't really heard many people talk about this. Did you notice the the shifting being better? Faster? Uh, Oh! It's supposed to be reduced. Honestly, I don't... Are we talking about the road cars? Because I... I guess I, you'd feel it more in the road cars, right? I, I I'm tried. I'm guessing I haven't really honestly I haven't really tried road cars since the update, so I'm I'm gonna guess it's in that area because I obviously yeah. there's some cars that you know like you, you could tell like for example in the world tours like some cars are just utterly awful because you you push it and then it takes like two to three seconds to upshift while someone else is like bam instant. So I'm I'm hoping. I'm hoping it's that's the upgrade that they're that they refer to, but like I said, I mean in a race car, you, you know, you just push the paddle or yeah. whatever, and you don't really. I don't think ever, I don't think anyone's ever complained about the shifting, and at least with regard to the race cars. Right. I mean, and it was a, uh, it was a, an update or fix or whatever to address the whole problem that people had where they were taking advantage. Oh, of, okay. You're talking about the. Um, uh, Okay, you're talking about the shifter. Where people, some people have the shifter with the, for example, with the G29, you yeah. can buy a shifter for it, and that was sort of faster. Uh, yeah. So, so, because what it actually says in the update itself is the time required to perform shifts with a paddle shift or controller when the transmission is set to manual has been reduced. So, some might assume that that what it that did was bring the shifting with paddles down to the same kind of responsiveness as doing it with the okay uh, you know sequential shifter right? okay okay Maybe. like I, I, the or perfect example yeah well, the perfect example would be the expo because that was that's the one car in which you definitely noticed the difference between if you had a sh- you know you had the shifter and accessory and you that didn't, 50 oh yeah that well. too yeah but uh yeah uh, i haven't had time did you look at the well, it's one of my favorite threads on gt planet and one of the one good reason to go there is there's always a thread that's that covers undocumented changes. Oh yes, I do look at that from time to time. And for one point three nine, uh, there hasn't really been too much. They just they just noticed that shifting with the clutch has been adjusted, so now you can power shift, and the indicator 
the gear indicator will show a pound sign or a hashtag <laughs> uh, until it changes to the selected gear. Releasing huh. the clutch will no longer miss the gear. Hmm. So, besides that, there's a lot of spe- speculation and placebo lights in in the forum and that thread, thinking things changed when they didn't. I think this tree moved over there. Do you all see that? No. <laughs> uh so yeah back to scary to talk about this uh maintenance notice uh if a bop does change uh do you think it'll ruin everything and (laughs) well i think if you look at the past i mean sometimes they've actually addressed a couple things correctly uh, and other times they do a change that either makes no sense or it's so far to the left field. It's like, oh, they changed uh, one example of a like. What was this change? Is I remember when the nine eleven got. I think it was like a one percent increase in power because I think some were complaining that it was a little bit too slow in the straight, and then magically, oh, Porsche had an extra percent of power, which it was already OP at that point, and now you're just adding more power to it, like. You can't. <laughs> like, <laughs> why would you do that type of thing? And then you know, you always get the weird ones like, oh, we change. Like, uh, I'm trying to, to think of a hypothetical one, like a car that no one ever touches. Like, I don't know, like maybe the Cit- like, 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 let's say like the Citroen. Like, no one, like, unless you're doing like a, um, I think one of the daily races is using Citroen, but otherwise, like, no one touches it in uh, Manu FIA. But let's let's just say, oh, oh, by the way, Citroen gained up one uh, percent of weight and it's like no one is no one's even touching it and now you're making it even worse i don't <laughs> it literally makes yeah. no sense whatsoever but I, I like i said i do hope that they do they do make i, I think part of the thing is that uh, just doing power and weight changes alone isn't going to fix some of the issues with the cars like for example i used to drive for subaru or as i have coined it, and now everyone seems to be using it slowbaru because yeah. that thing is tragic on the straights. Now, well, you, the, know, you know what a uh, Subaru spelled backwards is? I have not. I'm it's not going to look it up. You're a bus. <laughs> you're a bus. <laughs> well, it doesn't drive like a bus. Well, at least the Group 3 does not drive like a bus. It actually handles, well, at least in the old physics. I haven't touched the touch it with a new one like the old one actually drove pretty well like it was one of the few cars I actually like driving around fuji because i hate i hate fuji with a passion but that, that was on the mm-hmm. one of the few cars which i felt really good at, at fuji but oh, yeah. uh, you know on the, on the straight you literally could be drafting behind someone the entire straight from you know the last corner all the way to the first corner and you can't even you can't even swing around to pass it was that bad hmm. but it's an interesting point i think i don't think Subaru has ever getting, gotten a fair shake in the Gran Turismo series. Um, certain ones are fun, like the 22B, um, yeah. like the older ones. But whenever you have, like, I remember in the in GT5, the um, GT300 class had their Subaru, and no one ever really used that one. And it was kind of, it kind of always felt weird to drive. But the Evo would always be better. You know, like the Evo would always win in straight up fights. It seemed like. Yes. I remember that, yes. But maybe, I don't know, you never know. Like, I always have have these weird uh, conspiracy theories in my head where I'm like, oh, someone at the studio, someone at PD hates this car. They're, they they must hate this whole make. It's like, does PD hate French car manufacturers? They can't, right? They just, some, <laughs> some of them are great, but others are just super li- weirdly strange uh like the peugeot uh, i know you're sticking with peugeot uh well that's still yeah up in the air but you went with peugeot for the preseason and uh you're gonna stick with it would you most likely yes despite like i said there's still um still fixes that need to be made but uh, like i was alluding to earlier that i don't think uh, power and weight changes alone is gonna fix it because like with the RZ said, the tire, wear, the front tire wear is really bad. Like even with the changes that they did with the manual, like okay, harder compounds, lower tire wear. Now 
instead of oh your t your tires just fall off a cliff right away some now it's some cars actually go faster over a stint it's kind of like a bell curve you know you start out here you get a little bit faster mid stint and then you only start falling off at the end but the RZZ is like you start here and it just starts going down and down and down and then it's kind of the last lap or two just falls off a cliff in terms of lap time and to me that's not something that's something you can't fix with oh we're going to lower the weight or we're going to lower the power because again the fu is the fundamental problem is that the, the front tires are doing all the work and over time that wear becomes it kind of goes like an exponential curve and so with some cars i think i know i've seen it in the past where they put in the notes that hey we changed the tire wear rate on certain cars and i feel that that's what needs to be done on the rzz on yeah there's precedent yeah like on the rzz like the front tires they have you have to i think like i'll just use that for one example like I think you can reduce the power on that on that car like two to three percent, lower the weight one percent, but then give it much better front tire wear, and it'll be fine. Like it doesn't need to be super mega fast and just annoy everyone on the straight because you can't pass the damn thing. <laughs> Even though that's what we'll probably have to do anyways. But like like for that car, it needs to have a change. I know like the Group Four GTR, like I drove it, and that thing's just similar issues. Like it's it, the handling is terrible, the front wear is terrible. Um, another car that I've been mentioning all around, the Group 4 McGann, which, uh, not the fast one, obviously, because that's, it's, it's in the similar world with the RZZ, but the regular McGann, the, the McGann Trophy, which, for people that remember a long time ago, that used to be, like, the super OP car. Yeah. You know, like, I still remember Racing Suzuka, with nothing but McGann's in it, but, like, that car is now, I feel like that car used to, it actually scored a lot of great points in preseason, but that was because everyone's tires went off a cliff and that car just had great tires all the way around. You didn't, you know, you could have qualified like well in the back, but then yeah. you could just stay out, not pit, and then you're going to finish second or third. And that's how they got all their points, by the way. That's if, if people are wondering why Renault finished almost made it to the top toe, it's because of group four, because they were able to employ that strategy. But now, uh, a lot of these combos are like, like you don't even need to pit anymore, and like mm -hmm. I said, the tire wear is a lot better. And so, the problem with that with that McGann is now it doesn't have the speed to qualify, and the one advantage, the the huge advantage it does have, it's no longer relevant to that car, and it's never going to be by the time that the you know oh maybe it's going to start going faster with the lower fuel rate. The race is already over because I time I already did a few practice races. They're not even now. It's not even. 15 minutes long, like one was like 13, 40 something. It's like, these are super short races. And so it's to where if you have a car that doesn't have qualifying speed and it take it, it relies on great tire wear for it to gain positions, I think they're, those cars are in trouble. And like for, like for those cars, they probably do need something like a power increase. But even then, I, I still remember trying to work something out with the Group 4 uh WRX, and I found that I kept increasing the power, and it didn't seem to do it much good for some reason. That it's probably because some, it might be with downforce or something like that. But I feel like it needs to be a more comprehensive change to either make some cars a lot worse with wear, or reduce the downforce but still keep the same handling. It's just I don't know. It's it's. I'm really hoping for a Bob change tonight, but you know, given the history of Bob changes, like it might fix a few things, but it yeah, might. It's going to be opening. A, it's going to be opening Pandora's Bob because you won't be able to close it again, and lots of <laughs> for everything that goes that gets fixed or goes well, another thing will go horribly bad. Yeah, yeah. We already have people picking. Uh, at least at the time of this podcast, you know, the update hasn't been. Not even been out there. You got I people know. already picking manufacturers. Like, uh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do it until after yeah, you well, know for sure there's us. no bop changes. And but of course, there could be a bop change between, uh, in between, which sounds ridiculous. But you know, if PD is willing to change the physics right before the last race of exhibition, which materially altered the result of it, then you never know. Yeah, it's uh, really tough to uh, predict what's going to happen. <laughs> And but it's definitely unwise to pick a manufacturer now, especially uh, now that 
people have been practicing since this uh, new schedule came out, mm-hmm. and certain cars have been lighting up leaderboards, and then people get excited and you know, sign their year away, uh, but things might not stay stay the same. It's a uh, it's a it's a it's a dice roll for sure. We don't know what's going to happen tonight, so I'll be excited to talk about the fallout and the next episode but uh yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see the shakeup of uh manufacturer picks and i wanted to ask you why uh you're staying loyal to peugeot and uh why yourself wouldn't be considering a change to maybe another uh because i did you find it uh disappointing that no one else in different regions really went for it or what do you think peugeot needs to kind of get up there well Part of the rationale with Peugeot was that I knew that exhibition was going to be a struggle with the Group 4 car, but the with Group 3 you have, you actually have two choices. You have the RZZ, which is uh, actually a pretty good handling car in its over regard. It's not a bad car, it's just it's a little bit slow and I tend to be more... I tend to do better with power cars and with handling cars for some reason. It's it's kind of a weird thing with me. It's, and I tried out the VGT, and I still I think the first time that I noticed that this car isn't that bad is training for regionals in Vegas last year. I think that was the first time that I remember that hey, this car isn't that bad because I I drove it around Dragon Trail, and even when we were in Vegas. You know, we had to pick our cars. Like, I had the VGT on my list. Like, hey, if this car's gone, this car's gone, I'm going to go with the VGT. Like, I was this close to actually picking it for uh, Dragon uh-huh. for Dragon Tales because, like, hey, this car's not bad. Like, mm-hmm. it, I mean, yeah, it's for, just wide. For MR, yeah, it is wide. wide. I will admit that like, that is a problem. Like, that's like the literally the big issue with it. But otherwise, <laughs> for an MR car, it handles okay. The, that, like, all the, M, all the other MR cars for. Uh, Maggiore just died like they had no chance and my car was like oh I could push on until the last lap like okay the last lap was a little bit sketchy but that like I had to break balance at zero I could have shifted it to two or three and be like oh I'll just live with it but I, I, I didn't like the feel of the car with negative brake balance there and so I was like oh let's leave it at zero I'll just deal with like the last lap and that's fine like and I, I did really well like I like I said I, I might have been able to win that race if I didn't pull up my cue but again like i said i think that car isn't actually that bad and um uh, hey i i somehow won uh a top split race which uh, that's the first time in like i don't know like since i don't know last millennium that i won <laughs> top split fia like i beat really good guys out there now grant you it was a combo in which the the thing was like almost the second faster than everyone else but the fact that i was able to do it anyways is just oh, it's it's like damn tough. i still did it and I was, was like, great. I was really happy with that, and and so I, I felt like, oh, you know, this car is gonna do really well on the power tracks, and even on the like, even at Suzuka, like I, at Suzuka, I finished seventh. Like I like, why well, you would expect a big big pug boy to go out there and finish seventh out there against the top guys? Like yeah, I did it. I, I got it up to seventh. You know, no, no, one's, no one's gonna pass you through the S's, and no one's gonna pass me through the S's. I mean, the thing <laughs> is wide, and and you know, it's gonna it's. It, it, it the car doesn't have too much drama other than um, first and second gear is kind of iffy, and again yeah. the width you have to be you have to be you kind of have to be mindful of how you drive the car and um, at narrow places. But otherwise, like it's a I think it's an underrated car, and of course I say that, and then they're gonna nerf the thing to death <laughs> tonight. So, yeah, right. But actually, um, as of this uh, podcast, I I might have some people on board now. Especially with the rule changes that um, basically act, we could ride, we could get into, you know, there's a possibility that we don't have to worry about the RZZ. Like, we don't need to drive that thing, or we could just drive it just to keep our points up for individual standings. And, you know, all of our results will be in Group 3. We're all going to use the VGT, or hey, maybe we can get enough, even more people on board, then maybe some of them can use the RZZ and be like a competition type of deal where, okay, like, we'll score good here but then there's one or two tracks where you'll score good there well at the very least like Peugeot's gonna make you know it's gonna sneak in there and then see who the better man is you know that's kind of the idea that I had when I picked it of course I knew of course back then we didn't know about the five rounds out of 20 of the other and so uh, 
I can't lie, like, that was a godsend to me. Like, once that came out, I was like, damn! This yeah. this could actually work. Like that was like the that was like bit. the one thing that I I didn't even think about. Like, it was the one thing that we needed, and I got it. Like now I got something to sell, and like I said, I think I got some people on board now. And so awesome. my 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 deal about oh I'm gonna you know obviously I'm gonna su- suffer through the uh, preseason, but to me like I want like I've already done some of the world tours. I want to get to finals. Like yeah, I'm willing to sacrifice. I sacrificed uh, what New York for this. For this yeah. idea, and you know, uh, if you know, even if it doesn't pan out, like just the fact that I got people to actually, you know, if I can get people to buy into it and get to do it, it's like, damn, that's it's kind of nice to see your idea come to fruition, and you know, hopefully sure, it's right? going to work out. Like, like I said, there's some. Uh, I think you know, if there's already uh, uh, Lasarth on the schedule, so that's going to oh, be yeah. good there. And then if there's any Tokyo layouts, and you know that they're going to throw a Tokyo, a Tokyo, one Tokyo two out there. That's gonna be even better. Like that's gonna be another strong track, or Saint. You know, they do another Saint Croix. Then that's that's already like that's already right there. Like three out. Of, like there's already three uh, chances to get really top, really good scores, or even to win, like max points. Yeah. But then that also makes it super important for you to capitalize on the strong tracks because it'll yeah they'll be depressing to have like you know a string of bad races at a track that really likes the car or vice versa. Oh no, I get that. I mean, that's kind of like I said, it is a risk that we're doing. Like we have to rely on strong combos, but again, kind of the way I see it is like the way that they reset the rules. Like I think it does hurt. It's all about scoring max, like the maximum amount of points. And if you're with a menu that's like, oh, it does, it does good here and there. It does good here and there. It's like it's pretty like above average, average to above average, but it can't score. It can, it could. It's probably not going to win anything. Then you might actually be in trouble just because so few rounds count now, at least in terms of for the man, for the menu standings. That it's kind of like, can you really rely on that strategy now? Like, you know, oh, let's just be consistent throughout the season. That might not work now. Yeah, I get you. You might, and... you might, you like, you might, like I said, it the, the the with Pug, it might be okay. It might be meta in two or three play like. Maybe in a few tracks or like near the top, but that's that might be all we need. Yeah, true. And this is a good opportunity to get into um, explaining the new changes. Um, so they were just released today. It was worded sort of loosely as far as what has changed, but um, the the headline was that the global manufacturer rankings points calculation changes. Um, so this is starting off with stage one, which starts this weekend, uh, the 8th of June. And instead of every round counting toward, um, the global manufacturer ranking, like in preseason, now it's, um, the top five out of, uh, 10 or 20 rounds. So what I'm imagining is the first three rounds are going to be pretty much as it was in preseason in terms of scoring points, the uh, zero to 40 system. But once you get past three rounds, it's going to start only counting the best three and then best four as time goes on. Uh, but some of that is speculative because like I said, the explanation was sort of loose and not incredibly detailed. So, there still may be some sort of details that are going to start to show show themselves once we get racing and once we get you know decently into this first season but um the one thing i don't know if you were able do you know if the um i know because the individual score is going to be different but um is i wonder if the individual um, score for each season is going to be three out of ten still i don't uh, my the way that I read it, I it, it only refers to the global yeah. manufacturer standings, and so I think someone brought up uh, that point. And to the way I understand it is that yes, like at least in terms of which manufacturer is gonna go to World Tour slash finals, it is just gonna be X out of Y. But in terms of okay, let's say your region, like okay. This region, this menu gets to go. You still need to beat whoever else you're competing against for your menu. Like for example, if um, Lightning 
uh, with EMEA, like he's with Slowbrew, like let's just say a this a, this other alien comes out of nowhere and challenges him for Slowbrew as well, then yes, I mean, most likely Slowbrew is going to qualify, you know, let's just assume that they're going to qualify, Slowbrew qualifies and EMEA is one of the regions it gets to go. Lightning will still need to outscore this other alien in order to advance, and the way that I'm reading, I don't see anything that says for individuals is only X out of Y. And so, in a way, like, you're in a good spot if you're in a good menu and you don't have anyone challenging you for that menu. But if you have competition, like, I could say, I could foresee this in Europe, like, they're, they're, they might still have to be racing the majority of the season because they have to stay ahead in points against anyone that they're competing against in the, in the same menu. And so I know there's going to be a lot of situations like that, especially for a lot of the more, more popular menus. Whereas, like, for example, in... I, I don't... I hate picking an, I hate picking an Oceania. So let's say uh, Central South America. Mm-hmm. Central South America, like, if you pick one manufacturer and you're the only one, you know, mo- good chances, like, you're the only one that picked it. And so you're going to have a far, you know, you can probably just get away with doing like seven or eight races because all the other guys are spread apart. And the one person you're competing against is like, let's say it's like an A rated or B rated driver. And so it's going to be pretty easy to stay ahead of them in individual points. And that way, you know, if your manual gets through a year and, you know, and your region gets to go, then it's like, okay. Perfectly, you know, it's perfectly fine. Don't have to worry about anything. Right. So I, I can confirm that it is a top three. Yeah. Oh yeah, and of course you have to compete against. Um, obviously, you're also competing against other regions. But I, I think you probably have an easy. Obviously, you can have an easier time scoring max points on some regions than, but like again, Europe. Or yeah, Europe is going to be difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think the tall, you know, the points different because in the first in this preseason, um, the gaps between places were in you know like the hundreds or so of points or or just like fifty or so, and I think it's going to be reduced to like single digit gaps in points between first, second, third, fourth, and so on. So every little, every single little point is going to really make a difference. So people are, I think, are going to be even more competitive in, in ultra competitive regions like Europe. It's just going to get mad, and now um, it's it does reduce the uh, issue that um, regions, highly contested regions like Europe, uh, Middle East, Asia, uh, Africa had, which was the whole thing with people taking their DR to stay in lower tier rooms or lower splits so they could uh, get a, uh, more of a chance of a podium and do better than the top, you know, than if you were to place in this top, you know, six or whatever in the top tier room only, uh, sorry, not top six, but if you were only placing five or below, then it's actually better to get a win in the, in the room, in the split up below that. And that's not so much of a factor now because, uh, you have to score, uh, it's, it's going to be the five out of 20 and you, there's, there's going to be a lot, you you do have to you're going to have to depend on getting your a high score in order to really make those manufactured points. I would say well. yes and no. It just depends if your car is like one of the strongest at a certain combo. Like if you know like you can't there's no way you can score forty like like let's let's say like like Lassart, like if you have a handling car, then I don't know. Like I, I could see people employing, like for example, like maybe if it's a good strong combo, then they're gonna raise up their DR to get to this top split room. But then if it's a bad combination, well, they might skip it, or they know one's coming up, they might tank their DR so that they're in a lower split. And it's like, okay, I know there's no chance we can get 40, but I still want like 32 or something like that, just in case, because you never know. You know, like I said, it's only five out of twenty, but realistically, you're probably going to need to do a lot more races just because it might come down to tiebreakers and then other factors come into play, and so yeah, you never know. It's good that they aren't going to make it. Uh, they weren't going to. They got rid of the advantage that people had in preseason, and those that had an advantage were people that could just do every single round 
and now that is not so much of a factor which is good but it also makes it more difficult for everyone at the same time because you really do have to try hard to get a top three position uh, or get a you know top five position whatever in the top room um, and who knows how population is gonna be affected also I mean some people might be turned off by the thing entirely and or not I mean it's hard to predict it's really difficult to to see but w after the first sta uh, round of the first stage uh, there's gonna be a lot of uh, interesting stuff to talk about oh yeah definitely people are gonna be moving there's gonna be shock changes in manufacturer picks there's gonna be um, new people coming out of the word work some people quitting altogether so it's uh they, if they wanted to shake up they really got one gotten one if that was a goal oh they did uh, i just hope that it doesn't come doesn't end up like nations where i mean look at this we, we, we've had most of our discussion has been about manu like no one talks about nations anymore just because for the most part it's kind of already been decided and that's kind of it's kind of like the like i said that's kind of like the fear that i have is that people are just going to quit and then then it's going to it might tilt things in someone's favor because certain people just stop playing and that's kind of the the one one of the fears that we have do have with the five out of 20 again because just because there might not be any uh real incentive to play anymore and that's you know that's unfortunate like i probably don't have to address it here but like nations is just a like i even i decided i i don't really want to do a nations anymore what's the point type of thing and that's kind of the thing that i don't i'm worried about the changes that that are making might lead to that for Manu as well, and that's just not that's just not good for the game overall. You need the people there to support it, and you know, I just hope that this doesn't drive people too many yeah. people away over the long run. Yeah, I'm definitely concerned about that too, um, because what would be really tragic is if uh, Manu points the rooms for for point or. Uh, the points totals, scoring possibilities in the first few rounds or the first stage, they could be decent. But then once everyone feels like, oh, you know, this manufacturer has five insane um, scores, so why should I even go into stage two very much? I hope that what doesn't happen is that stage two becomes you know, more of a, or the points kind of go away because less people are contesting it. And then at that point, it does become impossible to overtake the guys that scored well on the first stage. Well, the upside is that, what, of course, the diff, the, at least the one big difference is that with Nations, it is the raw score that comes into play and so someone that scores like 3,000 points and now you can't score 3,000 points anymore, then yeah, there's no point. But at least with Manu, it's like you, you, no matter which round it is, the top score is 40 points and so you still, you might, you still have an incentive to play Later on, because like, oh, this guy's got five four like three forties already, and only have one, but there's still five races left. I can still score forty like the max points in the last few and catch up. So at least in that regard, it's it's better, and maybe they should try something similar with. I'm digressing, but maybe they should think of something similar for nations in the future to have it so that different point systems so as to you know, you could still you still have an incentive to play because right now you really don't in certain regions. Like it's pretty much decided. Yeah, it seems like the only place where it's um, contested are certain countries that don't have much uh, top flight talent, I guess. But besides that, yeah, I mean, how how bad were the scores toward the end of that last season? There, I'm trying to think with nations. Yeah, I think top. Somebody said top score was like a two thousand. Yeah, uh, to at least for North America, like the top score, like the top scores, like twenty seven, twenty eight hundred points or something around that range. And now it's not even. I I I didn't touch the last nations combo, but I think maybe like maybe two thousand, at most for the best room, and that's just not. You can't do anything with that score. It's useless. I I think someone in. Uh, Oceana said, now it's, okay, I won three out of the last four races, and none of them beat my scores from, you know, it was, those points aren't even good enough for third in the first few races of Nations. It's like, it, what's the incentive there? Like, these guys, that, that's kind of the thing. Is like, the top guys can just stop playing, and now you pretty much prevent anyone else from overscoring you, and that's, 
you know, it's a huge flaw with the nation system as it stands because, again, you just don't have... There's no motivation to play, and I was, I'm, I was kind of hoping that maybe for the World Tour, it's like, okay, it's going to be round, like, for this one, it's going to be rounds 11 through 20, but from what I've been told, that's not the way it works. It's it's taking all the scores rather than just a certain rounds, and that's not... I, I really, I, I hope... Like I said, I I don't have an incentive to play anymore other than hey, I like this combo. I'm just gonna run it. Type of thing. Yeah, me either. I share the same exact sentiment. Have you done any super cup stuff? I did two, and <laughs> I decided this is not for me because yeah, number day. one, um, I actually switched from a G29 to a TGT, and for some reason, I feel like I'm far slower with the TGT with road cards like th- that's a whole road card by the way that's a complete like i can go off for another hour on, on road cards and gt sport but i'll just skip that for now but um number one like i struggle with that car and number two uh i haven't followed some of the later ones but it's all you just put it on fuel map three or four you save the tires you just go out there you just run your laps and you can't really overtake it's kind of hard to overtake. It's just a train. It's like a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute train and nothing really happens. It's like, that's not, this is not racing. Like we're not going flat out. There's no strategy. There's no real strategy involved. It's kind of just, you know, at least with the manual, like with the manual races, you're, well, for most of us, you can go flat out and not worry about tire wear and fuel and whatnot. But Super Cup is like, it's kind of like a Sunday drive and you're not getting anything done. It's like, okay, yeah. I'm not, there's no way for me to, to to score enough points, and so I I stop playing. And besides, right. I mean, it's already you already got Manu, and if you you're still involved in nations, you got to practice for that. And now you got the third thing on top of it, which is road <laughs> yeah, cars. It's, a much. it's just it's just too much. Yeah, it really is. That's why I, I am having fun living life of single series bachelor. I'm single, guys. I only go for one. This is a different definition of being single. <laughs> <laughs> but on that note, we will leave this podcast as a success or mark it as a success. And uh, I'd like to say that I had a lot of fun doing this first podcast with you, Rich, man. And I really hope you can come around for another one. We'll have a little party with Tristan or some other crazy Gran Turismo addict. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you have a Good evening up there in your Pacific Northwest living butt self. Well, and... Pacific Northwest until um, I'm actually going to go to F1 Montreal oh, this yeah. weekend. So yeah, that's going to be exciting because I figured I figured that I probably not going to, in case I don't go to another world tour. Like I want to at least go like go out there on my own. Like I know it's going to cost a that's lot awesome, of money, man. but yeah, I love it. That's, yeah, Montreal. Le- learn a little French. You know, wee wee. No, no, whatever you want to say. Yeah, well, I know <laughs> nothing other than wee wee and ooh, and the two ha, ha, ha. <laughs> uh, 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 That's what you say when you see uh, Mercedes uh, break down in front of your eyes. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> oh, ha. oh, you're a Mercedes fan? <laughs> oh, you could say I, I. It's kind of weird that I say that I am, even though they're dominating, and I normally don't like. I start hating teams that start dominating, but. Uh, me too well i'm a lewis fan uh, i used to be a mercedes fan sort of i was more of a mclaren fan for a long time mm-hmm. but then when uh they kicked ross braun out i was really upset and i hated total wolf for a couple years and now i'm okay with him but i don't like mercedes as much as i like lewis and i follow lewis so i like when mercedes wins but i don't rub it in people's faces put it that way yes Yes, but you'll have fun. And I do hope for more of a close fight between the two giants, but uh, it seems like it's just uh, really, really No, tough. it's just like, it's kind of like, with, you know, GT Sport with the bob completely broken. It's like, <laughs> there you go, the Alpha Force he just drives into the sunset and everyone else is just <laughs> money fighting for scraps. It's, it's money, man. Uh, nobody spends more than they do. So it boils down to in the end. Uh, but... Yeah, I think it's great, man. You're going to meet up with Def Sun, a lot of the Turismo family, and that'll be cool. Get to see them and hang out with them. Hopefully not uh, get recruited. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, one thing I want, I'll note before we end, like one of the things about me, one of the big things about me is that I try to keep myself independent. And so 
Yeah. I don't. I, yeah. I don't. It's like, it's like okay, I'm a fan of this and that, but I, I I try not to associate with the team or whatnot, just so that if anyone has an issue, it's like, oh, this guy is independent. Like this guy will speak his mind. This guy isn't. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I might have certain biases here, and just like oh, I like this guy, but you know, even the guys that are like, like, dude, you're great, but this was wrong. Like I, I'm willing, I'm willing to do that, and I always like to portray that out there. And so, for the, I'll probably say is, I, I have a feeling that they'll probably try to recruit me. But you know, it's. Oh, that's cool. I'm just going I, think you, I, I think you would fit in, but it would be. It, it's a great group, but it would be funny. It, it'd be a funny way to initiate, be initially yeah, initiated into a, a club. Like they take you go to a race, hang out with them, and then they pour you know, uh, Canadian beer and maple syrup down your throat, and you're in. <laughs> probably. Yep. <laughs> but yeah uh so again second time we're saying goodbye but this is the final one thanks so much for joining me for this episode outlaw have a great night take care everyone everyone yes please do take care and uh looking forward to hearing feedback from you and for you to join us for the next one so until then keep an eye on the uh, manufacturer picks and uh drop us a line anywhere that we have a link for that in the description and all that does uh, feedback is super important look out for us on itunes coming very soon and goodbye thank you